Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 250, Diary of an Unintentional Extraordinary Life, 7, Home Invasion, read by Mitchell Two. opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, even a superhero might invert two numbers. Hello? Uh, Hello? Are we recording? Hmm. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's working now. Uh, uh, hi there. Um, welcome to my podcast. It's the first one. Well, not really the first. I've been writing online posts, you see. But the business consultant at Hero on the Way told me blogs are ancient history. Do a true crime podcast, she said, or start a TikTok channel. Gets better something. I wish I knew what that something was, but I could only afford five minutes of her time. Also, I couldn't afford a camera, so... Well, anyway, here I am in almost full-spectrum mono. Uh, Almost. I apologize for not posting anything online in such a long time. The truth be told, and it is rather humiliating, nothing much has happened. I got depressed reading posts on the Superhero Slack channel about the exciting and glamorous gigs everyone else seems to be getting. All I had to write about was my grocery shopping and laundry issues. You see, I shrunk my superhero cape and was asking for suggestions. Someone had the audacity to point out it was one of those cheap knockoff brands, and even without reading the label, I should have known you can only hand wash in coal and hang to dry cheap cotton blends. My cape is now the size of a hand towel, and its beautiful rich black and gold is now light gray and pale yellow. I mean, Really, is hand-washing practical for a cape which in theory should be made to survive a nuclear explosion? I posted. The replies boiled down to, you get what you pay for, and LOL. I'd like to imagine I had the same laundry incident with my custom-made superhero jumpsuit, although that can be traced to the small matter of stress-eating. Why stress-eating, you might ask? Well, Business has been so slow that I've had to pick up a part-time minimum wage job, cleaning porta potties Just to remind you, in case you've forgotten, I am a superhero from a family of superheroes. My sister, Ephemera, has the ability to teleport at will, and Cousin Vortex can create tornadoes. Both of my parents are Class A heroes, now retired, and... I am Dr. Slow-Mo. I can slow time. Pretty cool, right? Well, there are a few downsides. Most superheroes have an initial trigger event, like getting hyper-frustrated or falling from a great height like my sis. She always was a bit of a daredevil, which brings out their awesome powers. From then on, they can trigger them at will. Well, uh, I can't. I need to be in physical distress each time. It's a rare affliction amongst superheroes, but not entirely unheard of, and I ended up with it. My trigger is particularly embarrassing. I can only slow time when I've got to go real badly. That limitation immediately knocked me out of the A and B class of heroes, and these days, that makes things pretty tough. My parents were lucky enough to have full-time employment with a pension plan and medical insurance at Heroes, Inc. By the time my generation came along, the company was focused on maximizing quarterly shareholder return. So, in a bid to cut costs and increase profit, They went the contractor route. 
Because of that, my sister and cousin, both Class A heroes, are independent contractors for Heroes, Inc. They get the privilege of paying for their own insurance and pensions. Profits are up, if you have the money to invest. The new name is Heroes International Corp. They bought out their competition, added international to the name, and started spending on lobbyists like there was no tomorrow. As a result, they get all the big government and corporate jobs, like saving the world from asteroids, aliens, and supervillains. So, the work over there is pretty interesting, although it doesn't pay as well as it used to. Me, with a Class C license, I'm a bit more limited. I can only do gig work for Hero on the Way. It's an app where citizens can hire a superhero on the spot when they find themselves in trouble, like having a flat tire on the freeway or discovering someone has stolen their lawn ornaments and uh, that sort of thing. But with inflation these days, people are cutting back and doing more themselves. There just aren't as many jobs to bid on, and it's more competitive to boot. So, I was really, really excited when I won a bid to remove an annoying raccoon from a house. I had to undercut my pal Synapse to get it. Okay, I admit, I actually ended up paying the client to let me do the job in exchange for a five-star rating on the app. Uh, let me tell you, those furry devils are mean when cornered, and their teeth and claws, man, they are sharp. I know, because I had an unplanned standoff with one at the dumpster behind my building. It ambushed me and took off with my garbage. After winning the bid, I quickly noted the address. Too quickly, as it turned out. Looked up various means to safely remove such vermin. Then took off to catch the bus. Uh, you see, I can't fly or teleport. Or run faster than sound. Or or any of those cool ways other superheroes use to get around. I can't even afford to take the hero-on-the-way rideshare helicopter. Man, transit in my area is... Well, just don't count on getting anywhere fast. I live in a car-focused neighborhood on the edge of the city. These days, who can afford a conveniently located transit-friendly downtown super hideout anyway? I certainly can't so I might have been a bit slow getting to my gig. I was standing at a bus stop across the street from a Super Bites, owned by Heroes International Corp. And now the only fast food chain in existence, they had bought out everything else to meet shareholder demands to diversify. There was a mom and two kids dressed up as bumblebees, carrying plastic pumpkin buckets waiting with me. I was about to ask the mama why they were dressed up when I had several frantic follow-up messages from the client claiming the original beast had them cornered in the kitchen while an entire family of raccoons materialized from nowhere to ransack the pantry. It's a veritable invasion, she messaged, then added in caps she would call in the losing bidder if I didn't show up in the next ten minutes. There was no way I was going to lose the gig to Synapse, so I gave up on the bus and started running. Sweating profusely, by the time I turned onto my client's street, I could hear screams and demonic laughing almost half a block away. Rather than just rushing in, superpower ablazing, I decided I needed to get more strategic. I had been reading one of those motivational books on growing your business, and there was an entire chapter on strategic thinking which recommended completely understanding a problem before you act. So I strategically hid behind a bush across the street and watched. What I observed sent shivers of fear and excitement up and down my spine. Ground-hugging fog flowed out the front door of my client's house and into the yard, obscuring an odd collection of lawn ornaments, which reminded me of gravestones. I prefer gnomes myself, but then, hey, to each their own. I've seen the movie The Mist, so I know the fog isn't a good sign. Suddenly, a group of supervillains spilled out the front door, laughing and looking around. 
A car pulled up, and I did everything I could to stop myself from yelling at it to speed away and escape. But, reminding myself I needed to be strategic and come up with a plan, I kept silent and observed. Three more demon-like villains spilled out of the car. They moved up the sidewalk, waving at their hideous friends, before the whole evil gaggle disappeared inside. That was it. I had hit the jackpot. My client's house had become ground zero for a villainous invasion that even my grandparents would have boasted about squashing. This was my chance to prove myself to my family and the Superhero Licensing Commission. I would finally get my Class A cert and join Sis as an independent contractor on the big jobs at Heroes International. Wow! The headlines danced through my mind. Dr. Slomo saves the world. But before I single-handedly saved the world, I needed to get inside that house to rescue my client. After all, according to the Hero on the Way Code of Conduct, saving the client first was supposed to be my primary responsibility in a situation like this. So, Fame would have to wait a few more minutes while I scooted in and got her to safety. Using all that strategic thinking stuff I had read in the book, I looked around, assessing the resources at hand. The only thing I found was a garden hose rolled up on one of those garden hose reel thingies. Of course, that was it. I had the solution. Thank goodness I had read the chapter on creative thinking. I would slow time to a stop, enter the house while all the villains were frozen, locate my client and extract her. Then I would stop time again, go back in, and tie all of them up with the garden hose. Finally, I would call in my pals at Hero on the Way to clean up and take all the credit for myself. It was a great plan. No, it was a strategically awesome plan. It was simple, direct, and focused on my strengths. Nothing could go wrong. I would have to write the author of that book and thank them. Later, of course. Right then, I had a world to save. I quickly downed two one-liter bottles of my favorite flavored mineral water. I had clipped my utility belt. While I waited for it to work its magic, I pinged Honcho, Invisio, and Synapse and let them know I might need their help. Oddly, Synapse's status said they were on a gig. Hey, I was happy for them. After all, I kind of took this one out from under their feet. I figured two other level Cs would be enough for the mop-up. Ten minutes passed, and nothing. I drank another half-liter, waited another few minutes. Then, the urgent call of nature took over my body. I had to go. Bad. And time slowed to a crawl. I used a sort of shuffle-like dash to prevent my bladder from being jostled around too much. It gives me more time to act. So, shuffling across the street and through the front door as quickly as a person in my condition can, I briefly stopped to assess the situation. The mist stopped just inside the door. Apparently, it was coming from a small metal shoebox pointed outside. Odd, I thought, but let that bit of anomalous info go, as I found myself standing in a room packed with supervillains, and I mean packed. There was barely enough room to squeeze between them. The concentration of evil was unbelievable. I mean, how could Heroes International's early warning systems have missed this? There were three Doctor Disasters, four Wicked Wasps, two Poltergeists, a handful of Meltdowns, and two Venom Blasts. Not only were these evil creatures on the most wanted list, they appeared to be cloning themselves. It was a worst-case scenario. Distracted, I almost bumped into the mastermind behind the whole sorted affair, Mr. Ice Raccoon, standing off to the side, obviously admiring his handiwork. But I was running out of time. I wouldn't be able to hold it much longer. So I elbowed my way through to the kitchen to rescue my client, stopping only to munch down two, okay, maybe three, make that four, four large handfuls of my favorite chips. They were sitting in a bowl on a side table being ignored. Great, I thought. Supervillains don't like them. More for me. Man, those raccoons had done a number on the place. 
I hoped they'd all get hangovers in the morning. Every surface in the kitchen was littered with empty beer and wine bottles. Open bags of chips and bowls of dip in various states of consumption littered the table. Professor Shadow was leaning against the stove, glass of wine in hand talking to Brain Freeze, no doubt hatching some horrendous scheme. Yet another wicked wasp clone was busy trying to open a bottle of wine. But where was my client? I spun around, almost bumping into Queen Cobra and Miss Fortune. Had one of the wasps stung my client, transforming her into a supervillain? I'm sure I read someplace that their venom could do things like that. It would make it almost impossible to spot her. So I decided to take a closer look at Queen Cobra and Miss Fortune in case my client had been transformed into one of them against her will. But my meter had run down. I was beginning to trickle, so I desperately dashed back through the living room and up the stairs to find the washroom. I had to cut in front of the minimizer. He was just about to go in. I pushed past him and locked the door. I let out a gasp of relief, and time began to flow again, then suddenly realized I was trapped. I looked around in desperation and did the only thing I could think of. I put my mouth under the tap and turned it on and guzzled, then sat down on the toilet to wait. Hey in there, hurry up! The minimizer impatiently bellowed and began knocking. The knocking quickly turned to banging. I don't know. Maybe it was performance anxiety or the chips I had eaten had absorbed the water and turned into a glutinous lump in my stomach that wasn't going to let anything pass through until it was digested. Note to self. Never snack on the job again. Regardless, the magic wasn't going to happen any time soon. The guy in the bathroom's refusing to come out. I heard another supervillain complain. We should make sure he doesn't need help. A third one said, Wow, I didn't realize supervillains were so considerate. Regardless, I just couldn't walk out into a house crammed full of the arch enemies of good. I tried drinking more water until I felt like a balloon about to burst. The added water simply sloshed around on top of the potato chip mash in my stomach, making a gurgling sound. I tried concentrating, but got nothing, not even a tiny urge to go. You can open the door using a straightened paper clip. Some devious evil mastermind behind the door suggested. See that little hole in the knob? It's for emergencies. You just stick something into it to unlock the door. I heard a villain run off to find a paperclip and did the only thing I could think of. I opened the Hero on the Way app on my cell phone, logged into the back end, and hit the emergency panic button. Less than a minute later, I heard the roar of a Hero on the Way rideshare helicopter outside. Downstairs, there were screams and sounds of villains running for cover. Where are you holding him? Honcho bellowed, his deep baritone shaking the walls. In case you had forgotten, Honcho's superpower is his ability to make anyone bend to his enormous will using hyper-yelling and uh, generally bullying people around with his rotund physical presence. There was a series of loud crashes as Honcho flattened a coffee table and broke several chairs. However, I wasn't convinced even Honcho could hold off this many supervillains for very long. It was now or never. I unlocked the bathroom door and swung it open, knocking the minimizer over. Miss Fortune, who was apparently the leader of the cadre who had barricaded me in the washroom, yelled some obscenity about how I smelt as I stormed past her down the stairs. I will not repeat what she said here, as that would wreck my clean rating for the podcast. However, I must admit I hadn't had time to shower after leaving my part-time job at the porta potty cleaning place. Add to that the sweat from my recent forced run and, well, do I need to say it? When I got down to the living room, Poncho was in the process of tearing the 60-inch flat screen off the wall to use as a shield to plow our way through an angry-looking mob of supervillains who appeared to be blocking the door. A rather short Dr. Disaster had taken out his cell phone and was frantically talking into it.
They're calling in reinforcements, I yelled to Honcho, and together we grabbed the back of the now-free flat-screen TV, held it in front of us, and charged the door. For some reason, everyone unexpectedly stood aside, and we tumbled out onto the sidewalk in a shower of broken glass from the TV. It was too big to fit through the door. Maybe we should have turned it on end. Hey, we were in a hurry, right? I rolled over onto my back and looked up into the surly face of a police officer. Quickly digging out my level C hero license, I flashed it at her and yelled, It's an invasion! Quick, we need reinforcements! They're cloning in there! I tried to explain. For some reason, the officer wasn't impressed. Several hours later, Synapse walked into our detention cell with a rather exhausted-looking police officer. In case you don't remember, Synapse has the biggest brain in the universe and knows absolutely everything there is to know and can't help but let everyone know it. That is their superpower. I've seen vids of the world's most notorious villains brought to their knees in tears, ears bleeding, after being exposed to Synapse know-it-all chatter for 10 or 15 minutes. The police officer who accompanied Synapse had apparently survived more than an hour. In a bid to retain a small modicum of sanity, she had finally agreed to let Honcho and me go. What were you doing? Synapse demanded once we got outside on the street. I was on a gig, the invasive raccoon job, I explained. Remember, I outbid you. But by the time I got to the place, it had been infested with supervillains. Did you get them all? Synapse rolled their eyes. I did the gig because you were a no-show. What do you mean? I asked incredulously. What do you think I was doing? Smashing up a Halloween costume party with Honcho. Synapse gave me an I'm smarter than you smirk. You were at the wrong place, Slow. You inverted the street number. I was angry at Synapse, but I have to admit, he managed to convince Hero on the way to keep me and Honcho on the roster. Something to do with how their arrangement with us gig workers could be construed as employment, making them liable for incidents like the Halloween party. He had to promise to keep his mouth shut and help them rewrite our contracts. Me? I had to borrow money from Sis to pay for the damage. In return, I'll be babysitting for her until my niece turns 40. And Honcho? Someone at the party videoed our little mistake and posted it online. As a result, Honcho's followers went up 100%, and he got hired to star in a series of home insurance ads. As always, give me a five on the Hero on the Way app. Hit the bell and follow my new podcast. I only need 9,999 more followers to monetize. Unless my mother stops listening, then I'll need 10,000. can support makeshift stories by heading over to patreon.com slash makeshift stories where for two dollars a month you can become a friend of the podcast and we'll give you a shout out at the beginning of an episode when you sign up you can also become a supporter for five dollars a month and we'll also list you as a supporter on our website your contributions will help us offset our monthly operating costs and give us the resources we need to continue to create original stories twice a month. Thanks for listening and helping us out. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. To get other great APN podcasts, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com, where you'll find Kyle and Dave vs. The Machine. To prevent the apocalypse, Kyle Marshall and Dave Yawn watch films ordered up by a sentient machine. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by the Well-Endowed Podcast by the Edmonton Community Foundation. Hosted and produced by Andrew Paul and Lisa Pruden, 
The Well Endowed Podcast explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds. The podcast tells the stories of how these endowments intersect with the community. In episode 133, Parallels, Andrew Paul and Lisa Pruden speak with artist Carol Wiley about her exhibition, They Didn't Know We Were Seeds. It is an evocative series of portraiture which invites us to consider the parallels between the Holocaust and residential schools by introducing us to 18 survivors. Subscribe at thewellendowedpodcast.com. This episode of Makeshift Stories is also brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.